Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, co-host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report podcast, and today is January the 29th, 2024. It's been 10 years and two days since Russia's illegal occupation of Crimea on January 27, 2014, and one year and 339 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression against Ukraine. Today's podcast looks at events that happened over the weekend. During the podcast, you will find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. There are map updates today, and the link is in the podcast description. The Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Ukrainian General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine morning reports, operational commands north, south and east of Ukraine, open-source intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission – the truth, because the truth matters. Let's start with the daily assessment. There are small changes from Friday, so if you skip ahead, it won't hurt my feelings, because I won't even know. 1. Unless the United States Senate creates a standalone Ukraine aid bill, additional US military and financial assistance to Ukraine in 2024 is extremely unlikely. 2. The actions of Congress are damaging the U.S. global standing as a trusted ally of democratic states and have partially contributed to increased kinetic and hybrid warfare activity executed by Russia and its so-called axis of resistance of Belarus, North Korea, Iran and their proxies. 3. The armed forces of Ukraine are facing critical ammunition shortages, particularly air defense missiles and artillery rounds that are directly impacting the ability to continue active defense operations along the entire line of conflict. 4. We assess that Ukraine's decision to build a 1,000-kilometer-long static echelon defense is strategically sound. 5. Russian forces have established an operational objective to capture Chasivyar, west of Bakhmut. 6. Russian commanders have put mission objectives over all other considerations and are committed to capturing the Avdiv Kasselian regardless of the cost. 7. We maintain that combat that closely resembles World War I trench warfare versus 21st century combined arms maneuver warfare will continue through meteorological winter, which ends on February 29. 8. We maintain that Russia's ongoing political purge is accelerating, and the Putin regime is accelerating its transition into a fascist state, and further assess that in the medium and long term this shift will endanger global security and stability. 9. While the possibility of an intentional nuclear accident caused by Russian occupiers at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains low, the threat should be taken seriously. We begin in Kharkiv Oblast, in the Kupiansk area of operation, or EO, where the situation has deteriorated over the last 48 hours. Russian forces were able to advance west of Sinkivka and south of Liman Pershe, reaching Liman Lake. Ukrainian positions were overrun due to a communication breakdown at the battalion level. A very graphic video we elected not to share in our situation report showed Ukrainian drone operators pounding Russian troops as they tried to consolidate their new gains. To the east of Kupiansk, Russian claims that Kislivka, Kotlerivka and Tabayevka were captured were partially true. Russian forces briefly occupied Tabayevka, but were pushed to the northeastern outskirts along the PO-7 highway. Ukrainian forces are working on stabilizing their defensive lines. For the south, Russian forces made furious attempts to advance in the direction of Pishane from Krohmalne without success. In the Svatovyo of Luhansk Oblast, the Russian Ministry of Defense, or Armod, claimed that Ukrainian forces were on the offensive near Novoselivska. Russian forces also tested Ukrainian defenses southeast of Stelmachivka, suffered losses and returned to their defensive positions. In the Kremenayo, Russian forces continued to attempt to advance on Terny, using armored columns following the same dirt road. 
Since January the 1st, over 50 tanks and armored vehicles have been lost, approaching the equivalent of a full battalion of mechanized infantry. Included in the losses are three BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicles that were up-armored in 2022. Mutual fighting continued east of Yampolivka with no change in the situation. Southwest of Kremenna, Armored made its traditional report of fighting in the area of Dibrova. Next, let's talk about the Donbass. In northeastern Donetsk and the Bakhmut Ayo, heavy fighting continued in a few areas, but Russian forces appear to have entered an operational pause as new reserves are brought into the region. Russian troops briefly advanced into the northern part of Bogdanivka, but were pushed back to the northern edge of the village. Both combatants have reported significant issues with mud, and the Russian forces complained about waist-deep water in the marshlands near the village. There are reports that some Storm Z units rioted and are refusing to continue their attacks due to terrain, weather and heavy losses. We cannot confirm these claims. Southwest of Bakhmut, fighting continued in the area of Ivanivske, with no change in the situation. In the Klishiv Kayo, Russian mercenary mail blogger War Gonzo reported fighting continued northwest and north of Klishivka and east of Andreevka, with no change in the situation. In the Toretsk New York Kayo, Armod reported that fighting continued in the area of Shumy and along the edge of occupied Horlivka. War Gonzo Semyon Pegov confirmed that Ukrainian forces were conducting interdiction operations in Horlivka, targeting military vehicles. Quote, Thank you, Lord, it started snowing, we love, but in Horlivka any bad weather is good. The worse, the better, is our Russian slogan. Almost half of Horlivka is within the reach of drones, and there is a hunt for military transports. Unquote. In southwestern Donetsk, Ukrainian defensive lines are under tremendous pressure, on the southern flank of the Avdivka Eo. Following the line of conflict, we'll start on the north flank. A Russian armored advance along the railroad grade was called an attempted advance toward Novokolonovo, Ocheretene and Novobakhmutivka by different sources. Geolocated video shows the Russian advance failed in the gray area southeast of Novobakhmutivka. Russian forces continue to suffer significant losses in the area of the railroad grade east of Stepove. Russia tried to advance on Avdiivka from Vesele and Kamyanka, suffered significant losses and retreated. On the southern flank, Russian forces were able to break out of their technical encirclement on the southern edge of Avdiivka, expand the area they controlled to the west of their ground line of communication or GLOC, that's a supply line, into the salient and push to the Tsarska Ohota resort. Heavy fighting continued, and we updated our war map. For the west, Russian troops continued their attempts to advance from the eastern edge of Pervomaiske and east of Nevelske. There weren't any verifiable gains. In the Marinka Ayo, fighting was ongoing south of Krasnohorivka at the Trudovskaya mine ventilation shaft complex. Russian forces continued their attempts to advance on Georgievka from the fishing ponds on the southern edge of Marinka in the direction of Pobeda, with no change in the situation. In the Vuhledar Ayo, Russian forces continued to attack Novomikhailivka from the northeast, east and south with no success. In the Staromlinivka Ayo, Russian sources claimed attempts were made to advance in the direction of Zolotaniva from Novodonetska. Mutual fighting was reported near Priyutne on the donetsk zaporizhia administrative border. In Zaporizhia, the only reports of fighting in the Orikhiv Ayo came from Russian sources. There were claims of Russian offensives in the area of Verbove and west and south of Robotene. Wargonzo claimed there was a successful Russian advance west of Robotene, but a geolocated video showed that the line of conflict remains unchanged. We we'll link to all the videos and pictures I mention in our situation report. And when you become a patron for $5 a month, you gain access to additional daily insights. In occupied Berdyansk, insurgents reported additional explosions in the city. We could not verify the reports. International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, General Director Rafael Grossi, gave a brief press conference answering questions about the status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, or ZNPP. Grossi said he would lead the 16th inspector rotation at ZNPP on February 5th and would travel to Moscow after his first-hand inspection. 
he told reporters he wanted to meet with Russian managers of the plant to discuss the issue of cooling water and what are Rosatom's, quote, long-term plans. Specifically, if Russia plans to restart the reactors beyond cold and hot shutdown, and if so, when and how. His visit to Moscow will be to discuss political and technical issues at the nuclear power plant. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov told Russian state media that Russian President Vladimir Putin would not be meeting with Grossi during his visit. Reporters asked how concerned the IAEA was about nuclear security and the risk of accident, with Grossi saying that his, quote, concern is as high as the first day, adding that you can have a good week and then you can have a blackout. It is an ongoing situation, unquote. Another reporter asked Grossi how he would rate the situation at the NPP on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being an imminent disaster. The secretary-general said that there were days where it had been, quote, near 10, and others where nothing was happening. When asked if Ukraine and Russia had been cooperative, Grossi said, quote, by and large, yes adding that there was frustration from both sides on how the IAEA has reported the situation at the plant. He went on to cite Iran and North Korea as examples of his organization's success. Wait, Iran and North Korea are examples of success? I have to ask. United Nations, are you okay? In the Kherson area, fighting continued in Krynke and the forests to the south, with Ukrainian forces repelling seven attacks. Ukrainian forces received close air support from helicopters, while drone operators continued to target Russian positions on the eastern and western edges of the village. Robert Madyarbrovdy published a video of a Russian ammunition cache near the line of conflict catastrophically exploding after being bombed by a drone-delivered IED. Jaga Jaga! Big bada boom. In Free Kherson, Russian artillery and aerospace forces continued to pound the cities and settlements on the right bank of the Dnipro River. The spokesperson for the administrative and military governor of the Kherson Oblast, Alexander Tolokonnikov, said that the city of Bereslav is, quote, almost completely destroyed, unquote, with 7,000 residents remaining despite mandatory evacuation orders. In northern and northeastern Ukraine, Russia continues to attack civilians in the Sumo Oblast. In the Khotyn Hromada of the Sumo Oblast, a brother and sister were killed while driving near the Ukraine-Russian border. The incident happened within the 5-kilometer exclusion zone, and the pair accidentally stumbled upon a Russian sabotage and reconnaissance unit. Pictures show the Russian troops shot at their car with small arms at close range. The last surviving civilian in the hamlet of Stepok, Sumer region, which had a pre-war population of approximately 150 people, was killed when a Russian artillery shell landed in his bedroom. 60-year-old Alexander Mikolaevich had refused to evacuate, tending a small farm. Here is the update for the Russian front. Russian state media released a graphic video allegedly showing body fragments found at the Il-76 military transport crash site in Belgorod. We are electing not to share the video due to its graphic nature. After a review by our analyst team, there is strong evidence that the crash site has been compromised. We included a partially blurred still image from the video in our situation report, and you can see it on our threads and Twitter feeds. A piece of unknown material has clearly been placed on top of fresh footprints in the snow, indicating the picture is staged. There were similar clips in other parts of the video. The administrative head of Tuapse, Krasnodar Krai, confirmed that the Rosneft oil refinery was knocked offline and the vacuum distillation unit suffered a direct hit, as we had previously assessed. The plant is expected to be offline at least through February. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers and analysts is funded by readers, listeners and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Here 
here is my theater-wide update. On January 27th and 28th, Russia launched eight Shahid-136 one-way drones and two Iskander M short-range ballistic missiles at Ukraine. Ukrainian air defenses shot down four of the UAVs. In Kremenchuk, Poltava Oblast, a Russian missile struck the southwestern edge of the Kremenchuk oil refinery plant. Our analyst reviewed the available data and, according to NASA Fire Information for Resource Management Systems, the missile hit an area of floating roof storage tanks less than 500 meters from an outpatient medical clinic. While the online pictures look spectacular, the fire was isolated to two of the tanks. The leader of the Hungarian far-right party, Mihazan Mozgalom, Laszlo Torotskaye, said, quote, If Ukraine falls, we will demand Transcarpathia. Also known as the Zakarpatia Oblast, it was once part of Hungary until the Red Army occupied the region in 1944 and annexed it. We had assessed in 2022 that Prime Minister Viktor Orban's anti-Ukrainian position is fueled in part by an earlier deal with the Kremlin to reintegrate Transcarpathia into Hungary after Russia completed its three-day special military operation. Well, that aged like room temperature milk. The leader of the right-wing party of Romania, Alliance for the Union of Romanians, Claudio Tarziu, said hold my tsuike and watch this, declaring that if Ukraine falls, the natural borders of Romania should be restored, including the Bukovina region of Chernivtsi oblast, the Bessarabia region of southern Odessa oblast, west of the Dniester river, and all of Moldova. I don't think Russia's going to agree about Moldova and Transnistria. The Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Rustem Umerov, said that unplanned inspections of regional commissariats, viscomats and medical boards were ongoing after continued complaints of illegal mobilizations. Warehouses for basic military equipment and provisions were also being inspected as part of another wave of anti-corruption activity. France announced it would provide Ukraine with 3,155 mm artillery rounds a month for the Caesar self-propelled gun through 2024. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but that's enough to meet Ukraine's artillery needs for 12 hours. German drone manufacturer Quantum System donated 100 Trinity and Trinity Pro reconnaissance drones to Ukraine. Greece has reportedly approved the transfer of unused Soviet-era air defense systems to Ukraine after a deal was announced by the United States Department of State, which authorized the purchase of F-35A multi-role stealth fighters. Greece has TOR, OSA and S-300 air defense systems with munitions, as well as ZU-23-2 anti-aircraft guns. It is unclear which systems would be provided and the sale of the F-35s requires congressional approval. Good luck with that, Greece. Germany Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that U.S. President Joe Biden is now experiencing, quote, difficulties sending further aid to Ukraine, so Kyiv's remaining military allies are, quote, at a very critical stage. He reiterated that some European nations are providing only limited support, which needs to be increased. For the 55% of our listeners outside of the United States, on the alternative social media platform Truth Social, former president and presidential hopeful Donald Trump publicly called for Republican leaders in the House and Senate to block further aid to Ukraine and not make any immigration reform deals with the Biden administration. Our analysts updated the table of Russia versus Ukraine heavy equipment losses through January 28, 2024. It's part of our situation report, and information on how to access it is in the podcast description. What's going on in the land of Mobix, Mobilization and Mir? Here is the non-combat update for Russia. The Kremlin-aligned Telegram Channel fighter bomber reported the loss of Su-34 multi-role fighter plane that was to make a belly landing when its landing gear failed. The crew is reportedly uninjured. An investigative report claims that Russia is purchasing specialized equipment from Taiwan through third parties in Turkey. The Russian rocket and space industry manufacturer Comet Corporation ultimately bought the metal working machines. 
High-resolution satellite images show that Russia removed 63 BTR-50 armored personnel carriers and many T-55 tank hulls from the 1295th Central Base of Repairs and Tank Storage in Arsenyev, Primorsky Krai. The BTR-50 was introduced in 1954, and its armor is only 7 to 13 mm thick. The dismounts have to exit through the top, exposing them to enemy fire and some are already operating in Ukraine. The Nizhny Novgorod Military Training Center confirmed that more than 20 Russian drone operators and instructors were killed last week at the Special Forces Training Center in occupied Ilovaisk, Donetsk Oblast. In Muram, Vladimir region, one Russian soldier was killed and another critically injured when members of the unit threw them from a seventh-floor window. The wife of the murdered soldier went public, appealing for criminal charges to be filed. A video made by members of a Stormzy unit from the Moscow and Aryol regions appealed to President Putin for help with pay and benefits. Quote, we were promised full social guarantees on an equal basis with all members of the special military operation. In fact, we have not received salaries. We cannot get payments for injuries or for participation in hostilities. Unquote. Now they can look forward to a prison basement or transfer to Storm V. I'll talk more about Storm V later in the podcast. Lieutenant Colonel Andrei Bystrychenko, commanding officer of a motor rifle battalion in the 150th Motor Rifle Division, was killed in action on October 25, 2023. His death was confirmed over the weekend by his brother. The illegitimate vice speaker of the so-called Donetsk People Republic, or DNR, said that there is a critical shortage of men to fill civilian roles in the occupied territories. Quote, this is due to military operations and the outflow of people from the region. Finding a qualified specialist now is a huge problem. This applies not only to the transport sector, but also to other industries. Unquote. Last week, the Minister of Coal and Energy made a similar claim, saying the coal miner shortage in occupied Donetsk was, quote, catastrophic. Wait, do you mean to tell us that men don't want to go to the occupied territories to fill jobs when they know corrupt officials will eventually forcibly mobilize them? Who could have seen that coming? There is another wave of Russian dooming in the information space after four months of offensive operations that has yielded very little results. Former Colonel and People's Deputy Viktor Alksnis wrote, quote, I understand perfectly well that today Russia is waging a war in which its victory is highly questionable for a number of reasons, primarily due to the incompetence of the military political leadership, its lack of proper political will and willingness to go to the end. Russian society continues to hang noodles on its ears about the most combat-ready army in the world, that everything is going fine, and that all the goals and objectives of the special military operation will be finished completely. The only positive thing we managed to achieve in two years of hostilities was to achieve parity with the Ukrainian armed forces in manpower. Russia's defeat in Ukraine will inevitably lead to the death of Russia, its dismemberment and its disappearance from the world stage." Unquote. The deputy commander of Rosgvardia Special Purpose Mobility Forces, or OMON, in the DNR, Alexander Khodakovsky, released a more carefully worded statement. But I think Russian mercenary mail blogger Roman Light put it best when he doom-posted. Quote, it seems that we have been fighting for almost two years, but there is no increase in brain power. Unquote. Finally, in breaking news, the price of coffins has reached a 13 year high in Russia. I wonder why. Putin's political purge continues, with the Vulcan Protocol now active in two Russian regions. On Friday, a Moscow court sentenced Igor Strelkov-Girkin to four years in prison with a three-year total internet ban for violating the so-called Don't Say War laws by making calls for extremist activities. Girkin held defensive body language while laughing with his guts as his sentence was read, and after receiving the verdict declared, quote, I serve the fatherland, unquote. Girkin was an FSB colonel and among the first Russian forces during the Crimea invasion ten years ago, and then went to Donetsk Oblast. 
He was the first Minister of Defense of the DNR, proving that Russia was directly involved in orchestrating a hidden invasion of Ukraine. He led Russian forces from May 16th to August 14th, 2014, until he was forced to flee from Slovyansk in the trunk of a car. Shortly after, the Russian-led offensive deep into Donetsk Oblast collapsed. In November 2022, Girkin was convicted in absentia by a court in The Hague for his role in the shooting down of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. The incident killed 298 people. In August 2022, he tried to sneak into occupied Ukraine through Crimea, but was temporarily detained before being sent back to Moscow. In October 2022, he volunteered with a private military company aligned with the DNR First Army Corps, but returned to Russia a month later. He claimed he was being used operating as the unit's executive officer while holding the rank of private. After he discovered his contract was only for one day, making him an unlawful combatant in the eyes of international humanitarian law, Girkin returned to Russia. In December 2022, he got into a very public social media war with deceased PMC Wagner Group leader Evgeny Prigozhin. Girkin was never popular in the halls of the Kremlin, and a month after the Prigozhin insurrection, the Kremlin determined he was a liability and had him arrested. In a St. Petersburg court, Darya Trepova was sentenced to 27 years in prison for the April 2023 assassination of Russian propagandist and alleged Prigozhin lieutenant Vladlin Tatarsky. It is the longest prison sentence given to a woman in Russian Federation history. The violent crackdown on protesters in Bashkortostan continued, where Internet access remains intermittent. On January 19, Rifat Daoutov was reportedly waiting to meet a girl for a date in Ufa when the protest to support Fail al Sinov started. Daoutov left and later was called to the local police station, where he was issued a warning. He was arrested while riding a bus and died in custody a day later. Russian officials said he drank himself to death with poisoned alcohol, while his family insists he was a non drinker. Doctor of Historical Sciences Marat Kulsharipov, Doctor of Philological Sciences Fanil Kuzbekov, and People's Artist of Bashkortostan Rif Gabitov appealed to the governor of the Republic of Bashkortostan Radi Khabirov to stop the growing violence against protesters. Quote, Unfortunately, all the red lines have been passed. They declared and called for investigations into acts of violence. In the Republic of Saha, Roskomnadzor continued the Vulcan Protocol for the fourth day, blocking access to WhatsApp and Telegram. Protests started spreading on January 23rd after the murder of an area resident by a Tajik immigrant. Anti-war activist and former Russian presidential hopeful Yekaterina Dunsova has been criminally charged for violating Russia's so-called Donsey War laws for discrediting the Russian Federation armed forces. She was administratively charged last year for the same crime and fined 30,000 rubles. On December 23rd, the Board of Elections rejected Dunsova's paperwork for presidential candidacy due to alleged paperwork errors. Izvestia also started a smear campaign against activist Maria Andreeva, who leads the group The Way Home, which is trying to get mobilized soldiers released from their contracts. Russian state media alleged without evidence that Andreeva is having an affair with the men on the register of terrorists and extremists. After the destruction of PMC Wagner, the Kremlin eliminated its competitor for penal soldiers. Convicts who volunteer for military service are now part of Storm V units. Penal soldiers and their family members reported that in the fall of 2023, contracts are now one year long and automatically renewed until the so-called special military operation ends. The release from prison is now conditional, with no pardon. FSB agent and leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, called on Russians not to celebrate Valentine's Day because it is Western, quote, propaganda for free love, unquote. Finally, in economics and geopolitics, Houthi rebels hit the Marshall Islands flagged, Luxembourg-owned and British-managed tanker Malin Luanda with a ballistic missile. 
the tanker was carrying a cargo of highly flammable naphtha from Russia while operating on behalf of the Singapore-based commodity trading company Trafigura. The vessel left the Greek port of Kalamata after making two ship-to-ship transfers from Russian vessels. Trafigura acknowledged that the Marlin Luanda was carrying Russian petroleum products and declared it had been purchased legally below the price cap imposed by the G7 nations. It was the third vessel carrying Russian petroleum products targeted by Houthis in less than six weeks. Numerous reports incorrectly identified the vessel as owned by Oceanics Services Limited, but they only serviced the lease. The ship is owned by a group of investors based in Luxembourg under the advisement of U.S. investment bank J.P. Morgan Chase. The Central Bank of Russia reported that 2023 exports totaled $422.7 billion, a decline of almost 30%. The leading cause of the decline was a 35% drop in raw material exports, including oil, coal and natural gas. And it was the lowest level of exports since 2018. And that's what we know. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.